And welcome back to the God Center Men's Recovery Show. I'm your host, Tim Holloway, and I am glad to be back at you again. Hey, look, if you're new here, this is a show dedicated to Christian men inside of recovery to live an awesome, spirit-filled life. Uh, if that is you, you've definitely come to the right place. Welcome. So we're jumping right back into our topic. So we are talking about masculinity and manhood from a biblical perspective. And I just like to stress how important this topic is, how important uh, men are needed, and that God is looking for a man uh, to rise up and to stand in the gap and to do what he has called them to do. And so last uh, episode, we left off at uh, number four, and that was masculinity and biblical manhood is having a fight and that is knowing and understanding that there's going to be difficult times there's going to be a war there's going to be things that we need to be engaged in and that we need to suit up and we need to show up and what that means is that we are being uh, diligent and understanding our role inside of that the bible says this that uh, that we are to equip ourselves with the weapons of our warfare right and that we are to take on this whole armor of God that we may be able to stand. And that is that we take on this whole armor that we'd be able to withstand the pressure, withstand the pain, with, withstand the temptations, and just withstand basic life struggles in general. So we'll be able to stand. So understand this. There will be difficulties. There is a battle for you. And there's something for you to be engaged in. And uh, so there is a fight. Every man needs a fight. Uh, biblical masculinity is about men stepping up to the fight. Now, I'm not clarifying what that fight is for you, but you do have a fight. And are you showing up? Are you suiting up? And are you girding the loins of your mind and saying, you know what? I'm ready for this. I've been made for this. This is my time. This is my season. Uh, that's really real important. So number five is this. We're talking about biblical manhood. Uh, put away childish things. Paul says this, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Man, that is powerful. So three things uh, Paul says here is that when he was childish, that he talked, thought, and reasoned like a child. So we're going to dive into this just a little bit. So talk is, of course, our speech, but it's not only just uh, uh, the things that are coming out of our mouth. It is the purpose and the, the intention of the words. Now, a lot of uh, Christianity or mode is focusing on having a potty mouth or having words that um, uh, cuss words or something. And we focus on all of these uh, majoring on the minors. And that is that we look at our mouth and we don't have a potty mouth. Therefore, our speech is okay. And what we don't understand is that this corrupt com communication has nothing to do with the simple words of profanity. In fact, uh, in the biblical days, there wasn't many uh, profane words or words of profanity. In a lot of languages, there's not uh, cuss words like we have in the English language. Most languages... The worst thing that you could say to somebody is that they're stupid or ignorant. And that was the same in the Bible days that if you uh, say your brother's uh, stupid or ignorant, uh, that is uh, fighting words, right? And so understanding this, that corrupt communication is words that attack and tear down. And that is words of discouragement, words that bring despair. Instead of words that build somebody up and cause them to grow and expand, they're words that begin to deconstruct and to tear down. Now, we like to think, you know, in terms of, oh, okay, so I don't say the F word, or I don't say this word, and I don't say that word. So I'm good. So I've, you know, I've done uh, the biblical mandate as far as communication, when in reality, the real thing is, am I building people up with my words, or am I tearing them down? Not if I stub my toe and say the S word, right? That is so minuscule and doesn't even matter. What really matters is I'm using the words of my mouth to build somebody up, to encourage and to uplift them. That's what matters. And so biblical manhood is the words that are coming out of our mouth. So moving away from childish thing. It's funny this word too is tied into preaching. 
and uh, teaching and, and the words that we uh, teach others. And I find that to be really important because, you know, as we grow and expand, uh, we have a form of communication that we communicate to other people. But as we grow, so does our method of communication. And that is that if you heard me uh, in my first Bible lesson that I gave, or if you heard me uh, 10, 15 years ago and you compare it to where I am now, you will see the growth and the impact of that communication changing. And that is when I was childish and when I was immature, I spoke like a childish, immature person. And you could tell by the things that were coming out of my mouth, right? And so looking back, you know, I think that's a, a really funny thing to look at and to think about, you know, um, the things that I used to uh, preach as gospel and really as I grow and expand as a man and as, as I learn his ways and, and as I'm guided and led by the Spirit, I see how foolish and immature some of the things I said were, okay? And so that's growing inside of the message that we are delivering to other people. The second word in this is thoughts, and that is the exercise of the mind, but it comes down to uh, mindsets and opinions, you see, when I was childish and was when I was immature, I had opinions of immaturity. A lot of my opinions were based upon my level of maturity and my thought process and the, the situations that I dealt with during that time. And so understanding this, that as we grow and as we mature, not only do our, the words of our mouth change, but our opinions changes. Right. If you ask me some opinions 20 years ago based upon the opinions that I have now, and they'll be radically different based upon how much I have yielded uh, to God in this process. And so third, I reasoned like a child, and that is to really uh, uh, estimate things. The estimation of the things in your life were very immature. The things that you esteemed were very immature. And when uh, the, the basic core of this word is to take inventory, and that is the inventory of your life was based upon immaturity. So this saying, Paul says, you know what? When I was a child, I, I talked and I thought and I reasoned just like an immature person. So like a child is an infant. This is an infant mind. This is the animalistic mind. This is the, the, the mind of the flesh. Now, it's figuratively talked about a simple-minded person and or an immature person, but it comes down to being a babe, and it comes down to being immature. How many of us have been there, right? I've been there. And so understanding this is that part of biblical manhood is leaving the ways of childhood behind. And that is leaving those ways. Uh, going from... Uh, childhood to manhood, okay? There's certain uh, evolutions and there's certain expectations and there's certain things that men go through along this process. And Paul was saying biblical manhood is about forsaking immaturity and the immature ways. So six, this is going from dependency and to interdependence. And let me show you how this works out in the natural. You know, naturally we are born, we are very dependent, Right? Uh, we depend upon our survival uh, to our parents or to an older person who is more responsible and more mature than we are. Uh, we're very dependent. We come with uh, a lot of needs and, and and not having the ability to meet any of those needs, right? And that is the state of infancy and maturity. Now, as we grow up, um, you know, we're supposed to move from dependence to independence, and that is where I begin to uh, take care of my own needs, that I'm no longer dependent upon another person to provide uh, for my needs, that I am doing that myself. And that is uh, independence. Now, this is a, a, a state where we transition into. And you see as uh, uh, teenagers, as they begin to begin to fend from them, themselves, they begin to be able to make uh, their own food and they're able to operate in an independent fashion is that they brush their own teeth and they take their own showers and, and we understand this independence. And so what happens though is that men get stuck in one of these two states. 
And that is we get stuck in dependency or we get stuck in independence. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Spiritually speaking, and as men, men could be 30, 40, 50 years old and still be dependent. That's the crazy thing, okay? And that is still in a state of infancy where we're not providing for ourselves. We're living with mama. We're living, we're, we're living up the system. We're doing all these different things. Or we're not able to get into the word ourselves. We're relying on other people to feed us, right? And so uh, we don't really dive in. We don't really participate. The only time that we hear any of the word or grow or anything was somebody speaks it and tells it to us. We're not, we're not doing that ourselves. Now, that is a state of dependence. Now, the goal of manhood, of course, is to leave that state of dependence and say, you know what? I'm going to be independent. And that is, I'm going to feed myself. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to begin to recognize my own needs and I'm going to begin to make sure that I'm taking care of myself. Because the reality is, is we don't take care of ourselves. There's no way that we can step into the next stage and begin to care for another person. Right? And so here we have uh, men, 30, 40 years old in infancy. And what I call it is it is being a stuck in the uh, prolonged state of the infancy. And all it is is me, 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 right? Like I need somebody to, to uh, feed me. I need somebody to take care of me. I need somebody to do this, that, and the other thing. And what we're failing to do is walk in uh, uh, independence. Now, you look at independence and say, well, that's an awesome thing. You're able to take care of yourself. You're able to provide for yourself. You're able to do these things. And we look at that as like it's somehow the goal of manhood or something. And what we have still is men in their 30 and 40 still stuck in this state of independence. And that is, it's all about me. I'm providing for me. I'm taking care of me and all of these different things. And there, haven't, there hasn't come this, uh, 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 this mindset of shifting to a more interdependent role inside of society. And so what we see, you know, men go through um, teenage years. And they learn independence. They go into their college years where it's all about me and they're, they're spreading their seed and their wild oats and they're, they're living it up and they're doing these things. And, you know, I'll settle down in the future and they start coming to the 30s and they're, and they're still stuck in this independent mindset of, of only feeding themselves, of only taking care of themselves. When the mindset needs to shift of I'm going to connect with another per person. I'm going to produce life. And that I'm going to uh, look beyond me. And that I'm going to begin to care for another. And this is where the idea of inner dependence comes in. And that is that I'm not only concerned about my own needs, but I'm concerned about the needs of others. And this is where growth and expansion happens. And this is where most men fail to get to. They stay in the realm of independence. They might even be married, but they still have the, they're still stuck in the independent mindset where everything in their life is all about them. And they're just uh, living it up, uh, living for pleasure. Uh, they might be married, but they're, they're living this more independent life. There's not this cohesive togetherness and there's not this oneness created. And there's definitely not a vision of how am I going to leave a legacy? How am I going to transcend the self? And this is what is important inside of recovery. If we're going to thrive in recovery, it's going to have to transcend us. And that is, it's going to be, have to be more than me living this abundant life, right? It's going to be more than me just being fulfilled and being connected to God, uh, providing for my family and just, you know, this comfort mindset because this is, this is the state of man. This is where he dwells and this is where he decides to stay. And that is, I got a good job, I got a good relationship, I got a spiritual life, I'm connected to God. I could just sit and dwell here and sit in this state and just uh, go ahead and, and stay here. And that's what many men decide to do. Now, biblical manhood calls us to leave childhood. And that is, not only do we leave the infant mind, and the, let me explain the infant mind for you. That's the animalistic impulses. That's where uh, fears come from. That's where uh, uh, lust and all those different things come from. It comes from the fear-based nature and the little part of our brain that is programmed to those animalistic tendencies. That's the infant mind. 
And so leaving that state and saying, you know what, I'm going to leave that state of dependence that I'm looking for the government to take care of me. My uh, uh, relationship's going to fix me and I'll finally feel enough when I'm connected to that person. And you, you get what I'm talking about. And so we leave that state and say, you know what, I'm going to be independent. I'm going to begin to feed myself. I'm, I'm going to begin to thrive. Cool. But there's another state to go to. And that is that you begin to feed yourself. And now that you are living on an overflow, now that you have taken care of yourself, that overflow goes into an inner dependence where there's another person dependent upon you. They're dependent upon you because they're still stuck in the state of dependence and independence, okay? And so we need to be the helping hand and there's a world that needs you. There's a world that needs the skills that you have. And this is stepping up into the state of in, in, uh, interdependence. Now, the, the danger in all this is stepping into codependent instead of interdependent. Now, codependent is saying, you know what? I'm broken. You're broken too. And I need you and you need me, right? And therefore, uh, all my insecurities are, are satisfied in you. And as long as, you know, I'm able to fix you and, and stuff, then I feel okay. That's not what I'm talking about. That is codependency. Now, a lot of independent men go into codependency. And that's a choice that you can make. But recognizing it, we are not meant to live in that codependent state. Now, we think that we're being the savior. We think that we are the knight in shining armor and that we're rescuing another person. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about stepping up to interdependence. And that is that you, you, you have arrived to the place where you've stepped out of just me, myself, and I. And that you have decided to begin to impart life to another person. Not impart death. Now that's codependency. You're killing each other. Now codependent relationships, the, the very uh, definition is that uh, it kills. Okay? And you think that you're loving. You think that you're showing compassion. But you're actually killing that person. You're part of the problem. You get that. But stepping up in interdependence is saying, I have received life. And I have begun to uh, walk in forgiveness and I begin to uh, get a little bit of victory under my belt. Now, this doesn't mean you're perfect in any fashion. What this does mean is that you can lift to the lower rung. This is what life is all about. Reaching down to the lower rung to another and bringing somebody up to your level. And what that means is that you're always a leader. Here's what we think. This twisted mindset. That we somehow have to be able to uh, be a helping hand to everyone. And to be able to do that, we must reach a, a, an elite state in every single area of our lives. And the reality is, is that that's just, that's just a farce that keeps us stuck in never becoming what we think we ought to be. Right now, in my situation, I have men that are on the rung uh, beneath me. I have men that are on the same level. And so I can pull men up to my level and connect with the men upon my level and begin to create a culture of how we are going to pull more men up to our level. Now, what I can't do is begin to train somebody who's on a rung above me, right? They might be able to learn some stuff for me, but if they're way beyond me, then I understand that that's not my sphere, that's not where, where God's going to use me at. God's going to use me at where I am to reach the person below me. What this means is personal responsibility for every man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you got five days sober, there's somebody who's got two hours sober. Okay? If you got a year sober, there's somebody out there who, who's got three months. You get what I'm talking about. And so you can only give from where you are and to the place that you are but there's always people who you can be reaching out to and giving them a hand up. This is interdependence. And this is the, the mindset that we need to grasp as men. Forsaking childish ways. That I'm not going to be independent. I'm not going to be dependent. I'm going to rise to the level of interdependence. And that is to uh, begin to respond to what's going on inside of my family, inside of my community, inside of my state, and inside of my world. You see, the reality is, is if we don't have enough for our family, 
then we really don't have a business going to our community. And that is that if we start taking everything to our community and saying, you know, look at how great I am, look at all the answers that I have, but yet we fail to be the answer inside of our home, then we have just uh, 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 skipped a process. And what we're doing is that we're, we're putting, our, you know, our household and our family on sacrifice for our community. And that's not what I'm talking about. That, once again, is codependent thinking. What I'm saying here is that we rise up in this biblical manhood mandate and say, you know what, I'm going to forsake the childish ways and I'm going to rise up. I'm going to begin to provide for my own. And then I'm going to have this overflow that begins to go to somebody else. That is a powerful reality. So from dependency to interdependence, Paul says this, brothers, don't be children in your thinking. When it comes to evil, when it comes to temptation, be children. Like be uh, uh, naive to it and forsake it and all the different things. Don't, don't let it appeal to you. But in your thinking, be men. If that ain't a call to biblical masculinity, I don't know what is. But he said, let your mindset think like a man. And another part we talked about, he said, fight like a man, right? Gird up your loins, think like a man. And we see all this masculine uh, uh, stuff that's talked about here. So number seven. It's self-discipline. 1 Corinthians 9, 27 says this, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control. At least after I have, I have spoken to other people, I should be disqualified. Now I find uh, um, the scripture is really, really powerful. Um, in the King James and the Old English, I really enjoy what it says. It says, I beat my body. I buffet my body. And I bring it into subjection. I, I love the, the terminology of what that represents because it is saying, I understand subjection. There is a king and there is subjects and there are those who are under the rule of the king. And so what he's saying is this, is that when it comes to biblical manhood, you are the one that has the, the authority and that you have the responsibility to beat your body and that is to put it in subjection under you. You see, you are not your body. Like there's some day that, you know, I'm going to shed this mortal coil, right? And I'm going to still be. And so the reality is, is that I am not my body and I'm not my mind and I'm not all these different things, right? But taking on the responsibility and saying, you know what? I'm going to put my body into subjection. And that is going to be placed under my authority and under my control. And what that means is that my body is going to do what I tell it to do. And my body is going to say what I tell it it's going to say. And I'm going to begin to think about what I tell my mind to think about. Now, now here's a reality that you might not know. Whatever you tell your mind to think about is what it does. And you start talking about how stupid you are and your brain goes, you know what? Is that the information that he wants? I'm going to go ahead and deliver. Your, your request is it, it, uh, granted. And so what your brain begins to do is tell you all the ways that you're stupid, all the ways that you fail. Right. And so what we got to understand that our brain is our computer and we are the one that put in the directions and the commands. Now, that's not to say that some of it ain't pre-programmed and subconscious. But what I'm telling you is, is that if you tell your brain to pull up some data, it's going to pull up some data. Start talking about all the ways that you are grateful and your mind will begin to do the computing process and it will begin to show you ways that you are grateful. You start telling your mind how you are going to uh, fulfill your lust and your pleasure and how you're going to get that. And all of a sudden, the Bible calls it this. You make provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Because you'll, you have computed to your brain what you want it to do. And your brain starts coming up with all the different ways that you can accomplish this. This is the way sin and temptation works. But you are in authority. This is biblical manhood. You tell your brain what to compute. Man, that's an awesome reality. So I, I, I bring my body into subjection. I bring what I watch, what I listen to, what I hear, the company that I keep. All of these things are within my realm of control. And I beat my body and I bring it into subjection. Now, I find that to be uh, a very forceful terminology. I like it. Because if you were striving for to be a mastery, if you're striving to be a master at something, that is an elite athlete, what would you do? You would bring your body into strict subjection. 
And that is, is if you had a fight that was coming up, okay? In nine months, you, you, you knew that you were going to be in the ring with somebody, okay? You were, you, in nine months, you were going to take some hits from Mike Tyson. Now, if I was going to take hits from Mike Tyson nine months from now, there were certain things that I would do. I would make sure that I got into the best shape possible so I could make sure to eat that punch, right? I don't want that punch to kill me. I would I have different people and I would uh, get punched a lot and, and really uh, get my body up to the point to where it could possibly take a punch. You get what I'm saying? And so this is just the amazing reality of bringing our body in subjection. Now, um, we do this for things that we really want. We do, okay? When I was uh, out on the market again and I was getting a divorce, right? And I was at the gym and I was hitting it hard, you know, two hours a day, 1,500 calories, just burning, burning, you know, uh, um, and going through that process of uh, not having a release for sexual tension and all those things like, oh, I was going hard, right? Testosterone city. I was going uh, 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 really have my mind focused, right? And that's, the, that's the, the drive and the motivation that I'm talking about that we have to have to be able to be successful at some of these areas of our lives. We've got to really want it. And we've got to bad, want it bad enough because there's going to be competing desires, no doubt. Okay, moving on. Brotherhood. This one is super important. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron. And one man sharpens another. So biblical manhood is about sharpening each other. And that is, it's about building a brotherhood with brothers. And that is men that you can connect with, that you can draw from, that you can uh, be honest with, that you can receive encouragement from, and that you can do the same for them. And that is that you can encourage them and you can sharpen them. And we challenge opinions. We challenge mindsets that we might have. And give us a different view and a different uh, perspective to consider. All of these things are required for spiritual growth. And all of these are required for biblical manhood. There's no such thing as biblical manhood exclusively, right? We think that we're being a man because we're providing for our family. And all we are is the independent man who, 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 who goes to work, doesn't have no vision, doesn't have no mission, is not thinking about self-improvement and all those things. And we're just going through the motions, of course, until we hit our midlife crisis or, or these other things begin to happen. And this gnawing sense of unfulfilledness begins to eat away at our soul. And it's important that you have a, a, a pack of men to get connected with and get involved with that have the same mindset and the same pursuit as you, okay? Awesome, awesome reality part of biblical manhood. So I'm going to go through these other ones kind of quick because I've used it a lot of time, but um, our, um, our admonition or our responsibility towards our family. Now, this is important. In fact, I should have probably mentioned this as number one because what we are to our family is what we can be to the world, right? And so if we are not uh, loving, if we're not encouraging, we're not connected, if we're not supporting, we're not, you know, uh, in one or whatever, um, then in fact, we can't really be that to the world. We can be a fake version to the world, but we can't be the real version. So family first. Now the demon possessed man who was healed by Jesus, he goes, man, I want to follow you. Like I want to go with you. Like I want to experience this excitement and the miracles and all this stuff. And, the, and Jesus said, dude, you got to go home. Like that sounds mean, right? Hey, I want to follow you. Go home, bro. <laughs> like, and this is what it is, is that, you know, we have to take it to our family first. Before we think that we can uh, change the world, we need to change ourselves. And before we need to uh, do uh, change the world, we need to change some diapers. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? We need to provide the maintenance uh, inside of our family. So family first, family man. It says this, to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Ooh, you talk about the, the, greatest, the greatest, hardest commandment is to begin to love others and our family as Christ loved the church. And this is the sacrificialness and all these things. But when it comes down to our children, 
Paul says this, provoke not your children to wrath. And what that means is don't, don't intentionally do things that make them, make them angry. Don't be that, uh, uh, that father who only wants obedience and that uses strict punishment uh, to enforce that obedience because any little disrespect affects your ego. You know what I'm talking about. All right. So manhood masculinity has a mandate to the family. And lastly, fulfill your duty and your responsibility. This is what the Bible says. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Now, when we look at all the things that I have talked about as far as biblical masculinity and stepping up into, into that manhood, now there is a lot of things involved in that. Um, but the reality is, is that the core thing, now this is essential. Understand this for a moment. Essential things. That is the very ba basic things. If we begin to practice them, they begin to affect all the other things. And that is root problems affect the fruit. And what we want to do is uh, change all the fruit stuff when we need to go to the root. One of the root problems and the thing that is essential and must and absolutely necessary for all the things that I'm talking about here is that the, the, the fearing God and to keeping his commandments. This is the whole duty of a man. Now this is that I revere and I respect and I value and esteem highly God. Now this is not a fear where uh, I recognize his power and I run away scared. That's not what the Bible talks about. In no way does it encourage any of that. Um, but fear God, esteem him highly, have respect, have regard for him. That, that means that we, uh, our attention and our mind is set on him. And the being persuaded of his prescriptions, and that is that God is going to tell you and to sway you in the direction that he wants you to go. Now, this happens through the word, happens through people, it happens through multiple different things. But the essential matter is this, am I going to regard God and pay attention to him? And am I going to be swayed by his communication to me? Now, this is absolutely essential. Now, after these two videos, if you watch them in, in their entirety, you ask yourself, what is God asking me to do in these areas? Is he asking me to stand up? Is he asking me to fight? Is he asking me to be strong? What is he asking me to do? Is he asking me to step up into this interdependent role where I begin to provide for another person, where I begin to reach down in the lower rung and I begin to pull men up? What is he asking you to do? And are, go are you going to yield to the process? That is essential. Absolutely 100% essential. Uh, uh, for biblical manhood. And I'm glad that uh, I talked about this last because it's the thing that's going to stay in your mind. All right, brothers. Peace. See you soon.